The death of Bumin, the founder and Khagan of the Gokturk Empire, probably sent shockwaves throughout the political establishment of the steppe. Bumin's Ashina family had risen in 552 to become a ruling dynasty with a claim to power over the entire Eurasian steppe. In addition, the Ashina wanted to extend their power political borders as far as possible in all directions. However, this was not consistently successful. And instead of pursuing any campaigns, the Turks first had to settle the succession. According to the old Turkish law, the Tore, there was no designated successor. Bumin would not have been allowed to choose his own successor before his demise. Instead, the throne went to the next eldest son of the Khagan. In Bumin's case, that was Kara. It is unclear whether the Khaganate was divided before or after Bumin's death. In any case, Istemi, Bumin's younger brother, assumed the title of Yabgu. He was theoretically one step below the Khagan in the political hierarchy, but now ruled autonomously over the entire Gokturk territory west of the Altai. Kara Khagan took over the administration of the territories east of the Altai. The Sayan Mountains, Eastern Mongolia, Turfan and Gansu were in the center of power. The border in the south extended to the oasis city of Hotan and included the entire Tarim Basin. And in the east, Turkic influence extended to the Liao River near Korea to the borderland of Manchuria. Istemi's territory, on the other hand, did not really encompass any fixed boundaries. We know that the Gokturks had taken over the entire territory of the Rurin Empire. However, the Rurin had been fought by the Heptalites in the 5th century and accordingly the Gokturks did not have these lost territories. Given this history, it is clear that Istemi was proceeding according to plan in his quest to expand the Gokturk Empire in the west. By an own estimate, the Rurin Khaganate had been between 3.0 and 3.5 million square kilometers in size in 552, shortly before its replacement. After the incorporation of rebellious Turkish groups such as the TL, the new Gokturk Empire then encompassed approximately 3.5 to 4 million square kilometers. Later on, at their peak, the Turks would rule over nearly 8 million square kilometers of Eurasian land. But why did the Gokturks have to conquer new territories? Was the Ashina dynasty simply greedy for more territory, for more power? Or were there also cultural reasons for the expansion? In any case, it was not out of boredom, for the western region of the Eurasian steppe was already bulging with numerous tribes and city-states. Convincing these groups of the Ashina's rule was no child's play, for here lived people who rejected any higher authority except that of Tengri and preferred self-government on the political level. A large part of them, however, belonged to a Turkic people, as this map shows. It can only be speculated that this was the reason for Estemi's campaign to the west. The Ashina may have known that there were many other Turkic peoples outside the Alte, but they had also set themselves the goal of integrating these Turkic peoples into their empire. The Casus Belli of the Gokturks was probably a Turkic irredentism. Apart from that, the Ashina dynasty also had the desire to become rulers of the entire steppe. Whoever ruled over Utukan, the mysterious sacred forest of the Turks, could proclaim himself ruler of all nomadic steppe peoples. In theory, the Gokturks already were. But in practice, they were still at the very beginning of a long, bloody adventure. While Kara Khagan had to fend off the attacks of the Rurin from China in the east, Istemi dared to take the first step and put his plan for expansion into action. In this three-part series, we will take a closer look at the reign of Istemi, Yamgu of the Gokturks. In doing so, we will also explore the question of whether the young brother of Bumin did not actually surpass his nephews in the east in terms of drive and political success. Was Istemi the greatest of all Gokturks? Let's find out. Istemi began his campaign in the spring of 553, gathering a band of 100,000 warriors and reaching the great Lake Yadisu, the Seven Rivers country, in present-day Kazakhstan in the summer. From here, the Gokturks had access to the trade routes of the Silk Road, which ran from China to Persia. 
Numerous tribes such as the Hun Chionites now joined the Turks. The cognate of the Gokturks thus bordered the empire of the Hephthalites, who were also called the White Huns and ruled over a wide strip from the Aral Sea to India. Practically exactly between Turkish and Heptalite territory lay the trading city of Bukhara. This ancient settlement blossomed into an important trading metropolis along the Silk Road during the Middle Ages. Even now, in the middle of the 6th century, Bukhara possessed an important influence on trade in the region. Merchants from Byzantium, Iran and China met here and regularly exchanged their goods with each other. Bukhara occupied an important economic position along the Silk Road and would soon be at the center of a major dispute. On the northwestern front, around the Pontic Caspian area, the Gokturks had to expect less resistance. This area had been a permanent settlement area of Eurasian steppe peoples for centuries, which appeared in the writings of ancient historians. However, a collective name like Scythians would distort the real relations among the ethnic groups. Thus, in the 5th century, the scholar Priscus of Panium reported that Saragurs and Onagurs, then part of the Hun Empire, arrived at the Eastern Roman in Constantinople and asked for help. They had been driven out of their homeland on the Black Sea by the Sabirs. The Sabirs, in turn, had been the victims of an attack by the Avars who had extended their empire into Western Asia and were trying to settle there. Leo I granted lands in present-day Ukraine to the Saragurs and Onagurs. We can conclude that the influence of Turkic culture already reached deep into Eastern Europe when the Ashina arrived there. For the Onagurs as well as the Saragurs were part of the Augur Federation, which, in turn, was a branch of the Turkish Tiel Confederation. On the one hand, this fact speaks for the wide zone of influence of the Tiel on the Eurasian continent. On the other hand, it would explain the absence of any sources about the battles of the Gokturks during their expansion into Europe. There were simply no battles to record. The Turks from East Asia did not fight the Turks in the West and yet, or precisely because of this, were able to integrate them so quickly into their empire. The Ashina clan thus succeeded in what many before and after them failed to do – achieve unity among the Turkic peoples without too many wars. But when Istemi's armies arrived in Eastern Europe, they were actually on the trail of another ethnic group – a band of refugees who had tried to seek safety from the Turks, the Rurin. While their ruling dynasty took refuge in northern China, most of the lower nobility, including the night caste, headed for Western Asia. In the process, they encountered the Avars, who probably had ties to the Rurin and mingled with them. It is still inconclusive whether the Avars who suddenly appeared in Eastern Europe were the Rurin from Mongolia. Due to thin sources, Rurin and Avars cannot be equated, but it can very well be assumed that the Rurin refugees took control over the Avars. Therefore, within a short period of time, the Avars developed from a tribal federation into a cognate. The title of Khagan, which now actually belonged to the Gokturks, was claimed and continued by the Rurin in Europe. Therefore, the Turks were after them. A correspondence between Istemi and Byzantium further reveals that these Avars were well known to the Gokturks. Before their cognate could rise to a great empire, the Avars had to consolidate their rule over the Slavic and partly Germanic tribes and for this they needed a promise of protection from Byzantium. In the process, however, they were pursued by Istemi's retaliatory troops. In a message to the Byzantine Emperor Morikios, he let it be known what he intended to do with the Avars. The Avars, who found refuge in your empire, once ruled us when we were their slaves. But now, these Avars are neither birds that fly away nor fish that can hide in the depths of the sea. Now, they are the slaves. They will not escape our Turkish swords. The Byzantines, in turn, hoped to mobilize the Turks against their archenemy Persia in the east. The centuries-long wars between Byzantium and Persia were like a tug-of-war for supremacy in the Middle East, and the Turks were now an important factor in this confrontation. But the Avars had successfully driven a wedge between the Turks and the Eastern Romans. There was no rapprochement between the Turks and Byzantines, for the time being. 
After consolidating Turkish rule in Kazakhstan and parts of Eastern Europe, Istemi turned his attention to Bactria and Sogdia, the gateways to the Middle East. South of the Hephthalites in Iran, the Sassanids, who had established a new Persian Empire after the collapse of the Parthian Empire, were just waiting to re-establish their historical dominance over Transoxania. The Sassanids and Hephthalites were therefore hostile to each other. Then, shortly before the outbreak of hostilities between the Persians and Huns, the Gokturks arrived in the area. Similar to the Byzantine Emperor, the Persian king turned his attention to the new power from Central Asia. Under the banner of the Gokturk Khaganate, the Turks were militarily more tightly organized than ever before. All the smaller tribes in the area now pooled their military capacities and could march off to war at any time at Istemi's command. But in the event of Istemi's conquest of Sogdia and Bactria, the Turks could have closed the Silk Road to Persian or Byzantine traders at will at any time. Moreover, the sedentary peoples were not aware of the Turks' further ambitions. Therefore, the Sassanids secretly approached Istemi and made him a proposal that he could not refuse. The first war of the Gokturks in Western Asia took place in Transoxania, after Istemi's troops had marched as far as Bukhara. The exact date for the military confrontation between the Gokturks and the Hephthalites is disputed and ranks between the years 557 and 563. As a compromise, therefore, many historians give the year 560 for the Battle of Bukhara. Turks and Huns fought against each other for seven days and seven nights in a protracted battle. On the eighth day, the Turks captured the Ark, citadel and ruling place of Bukhara, wresting the city from Hun control. Later, it would turn out that Istemi had held a secret rendezvous with the Persian king Khosrow before the battle. Both had agreed on a joint war against the White Huns. When the Turks entered Bukhara from the northeast, Persian soldiers with their war elephants marched in from the southwest at the same time. Thus, the White Huns were hemmed in from both sides and annihilated. Bukhara went to the Turks. After Istemi established his rule over the trading city, he learned that the White Hun nobility had left the area before the battle and fled to Afghanistan. There, the nobility crowned a man named Faganish as their king. But after the Persians invaded there as well, Faganish became distressed and had to submit his people to the rule of the superior Persians. Istemi then changed his attitude toward the Huns and offered Faganish both refuge and a piece of land in the Khaganate. Faganish accepted, and so the remaining Hephthalites became the vassals of the Gokturks. They were allowed to retain lesser Hunnic royal titles and were only required to recognize the authority of the Ashina dynasty. Istemi thus integrated Hunnic warriors into his army and, by conquering Sogdia, simultaneously deprived the Persians of a strategically important source of power. In the following years, many Turks settled in the cities along the Silk Road, including Tashkent and Samarkand. So, they came into close contact with the Sogdians, a people consisting mainly of merchants, traders, and diplomats. The surrounding region is now called Turkestan, the land of the Turks, who rose to become the dominant culture in the months that followed. While the Gok Turks were still in power, there was a real economic boom in Central Asia. Chinese reports show that agriculture, industry, manufactures, and trade of the mainly Iranian natives in the west of the Khaganate experienced a new flourishing. The Gok Turks also financially supported the development of infrastructure. For example, Sewage systems in Sogdia were repaired after decades of wars. The Tashkent region of Kyrgyzstan also saw technical advances in pottery and glazing. However, after the White Huns were defeated, the Khaganate boarded the Sassanid Empire for the first time. The border remained unsettled. Moreover, there was a question about the control of the trade routes leading to East Asia. The skepticism of King Khosrow towards the Turks was great and this skepticism of each other was mutual. Fearing that Istemi was secretly preparing an invasion of Sassanid territory, Khosrow personally marched one day with a large army to the border region to Tabaristan, Gurgan, on the southern coast of the Caspian Sea. And indeed, there he met Istemi. But the Yabgu of the Gokhtar Khaganate had not come alone. He came as a representative of the Turkic world and with thousands of warriors in his baggage. 
a confrontation between Turks and Persians seemed inevitable. The story of Estemi continues in episode 2. In it, we will discuss the enmity of the Turks and Persians as well as the role of the Sogdians, a mysterious people of merchants who would prove to be essential for the future of the Gok Turks. If you liked this video, leave a like, and if not, write in the comments what we could do better. Emery, the producer of this video, would be happy about a subscription. And if you decide to support the Khans Cave on Patreon, he would be even more thankful. Your fundings have enabled him to produce higher quality videos. Thanks for watching and see you next time.